Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This verse is taken from Psalm 118, and it is good. It's a good verse for us to recite every day, even good days and bad days, to express our gratitude to God. Welcome to worship service this morning. I'm glad you're here, and I want to welcome everyone who's watching online. Good morning to you. And if you're visiting here today, we are glad that you're worshiping with us. And uh, please take a moment or two and fill out our white connection card that's in the front of the seat back in front of you. Just write down some information about yourself. We'd love to, love to know more about you. And just put it in the offering plate. There's one in, in the back. On the back side of the connection card is a place for prayer requests. If you have a prayer for yourself or if you know somebody who needs prayer, Please write that request down and let our prayer team pray for you. Please rise if you're able for the call to worship. The, the call to worship is from the book of Psalm, chapter 92, starting with verse 1 through 4. It is good to praise the Lord. And make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. To the music of the ten string lair and the melody of the harp, for you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Let us pray. Father God, it is good for us to be here today worshiping you, our Heavenly Father. It is good for us to give thanks to you, O Lord Most High. It is good for us to worship and to honor God using our musical talents. It is good for us to lift up our voices singing praises to your holy name. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us today in this place, and we are deeply grateful for your mighty works. In your holy name we pray, amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm very privileged to be in this spot again, um, and as Rich said, let's um, make music to his name.
hear me? Now? Now? Oh, good. Okay, I can hear myself. I, my name is Sherry Bennett. I am here this morning to hopefully tell you something exciting, and that is that our ladies' Bible study is about to resume this fall. And, and I am very excited about it. In fact, um, James, I'll be as quick as possible because I'm so excited I could talk all morning. So, but I won't. <laughs> so what I'm here to tell you this morning is just some basics. We will be starting on September 16th at 6.30, and it'll be right here in the sanctuary. Um, I would like to have anybody who's interested, your email and your phone numbers, your, your cell phone numbers, because how we will stay in touch is through email and text or if I need to call you. So Bessie Lambert, um, who is, leads our women's ministry, uh, will be sending out an email this week with all the details. If, um, if, you, if you know or don't know whether she has your email, please make sure that she does. Uh, or see me afterwards and I'll get it to her because it'll have all the details you need to know. The book that we will be studying is the, the Gospel of John. I'm very excited about the Gospel of John. Um, I want to tell you, you will need three things. Okay? One is a desire to know your Heavenly Father and your Savior in a more intimate way. Um, if you, you know, you, you want to know your parents, you want to know your brothers and sisters, you want to know your friends, the way you know Jesus, the way you know God is to study his word. So that's the first thing you will need. The second thing you will need is, a, is your Bible. You can't do a Bible study without a Bible. So that will be what we're studying. We're not studying a book that somebody has written. We are studying the Bible, and it'll be the book of John. Now, we will use a study guide. The study guide we're going to use is Knowing the Bible series. It is one that we have used in this church before. I think this one is exceptionally well written. Uh, the author is Justin Buzzard. Uh, the theological editor is J.I. Packer. So there comes with some credentials there, I think, that are, are, are trustworthy. I have actually facilitated the study before but I will be starting fresh with you. I've actually ordered a new book so that it has none of my writing that's in this book so that we will be studying this together. The one thing that I'll ask you to do before September 16th, it's just one thing, read the book of John. Please read the book of John if, you're, if you plan to study with us. It will, you don't have to do the first week in this study guide. We'll do that together. Just read the book of John. There's 21 chapters in the book of John. We have about 20 days or so, 18 days before we meet. I think you could read John a few times in that period of time. The more you read it, the more God will reveal his truth to you. The last thing I want to say to you is that I encourage you to come. Not because of anything I'm going to say, but because of what this Bible is going to say to you. Also, I want to assure you, if you've never attended a Bible study or you've been in intimidated when you went to a Bible study because you were afraid somebody was going to call on you or ask you to read something, and gosh, look at all those words I don't know how to pronounce. No one is going to call on you. No one's going to put you on the spot to answer a question that you're not comfortable answering. So it'll be very, very much all of us sharing together as God leads. So I look forward to seeing you on September 16th. If you have any questions, be sure and call me, email me, or just track me down. <laughs> Thank you. That's for all the women in the church. Again, we'd love for you to join in one of our studies. Uh, the other announcements we have, one being that our men's study is actually starting Tuesday. So we, for once, are ahead of the ladies in something. Uh, but we are starting on Tuesday night, 7 p.m. We're studying the book of Zechariah, so if you're interested in that, you can see me. But mainly just show up here, 7 p.m. on Tuesday. We gather around the table. We will spend time in God's Word, uh, very similar to what Sherry was saying. We are going to spend time uh, opening God's Word, studying together, 
Uh, unfortunately for the men, we do not have a study guide, but I would encourage you the same thing. Uh, read the book of John, uh, and then read the book of Zechariah as well. So, uh, again, you can never go wrong just reading God's Word. And that's what we're going to really strive for in our men's and women's study. This is where we want to help you develop, grow in your love for the Lord, but in also how to study God's Word. That's what we'll be doing. How do we grow in our faith? How do we walk together in this? Uh, a couple other announcements to make you aware of, though. If you have youth age children or friends or someone in that category, we have youth tonight at 6.30. We'd love for you to come be a part of what we're doing. You can see Casey, myself. Uh, we'd love to just point you in the right direction. That'll be here at the church. Uh, one thing we are asking, some of you got maybe an email or a text. If you want to help the youth and you say, I don't want to actually be part of the youth, I don't want to come and do youth, uh, we are looking for people to do meals for the youth as well. So if you're interested in just providing a meal or even a lovely gift card to say, hey, I would love just to support the youth, uh, we'd be glad to take that off your hands as well. Uh, and two other things real quickly. Uh, we do have the Women's Beach Day. Everything's on that back board, uh, bright yellow poster. Uh, but the main thing is on Saturday, the 11th of September from 9 to 12, the women are going to have a Women's Beach Day. Uh, it's at the Guana uh, location, so don't go to Michler. You'll do a lot of walking to get there. Uh, but again, if you're interested in that, you can see Bessie. Uh, she's in the back. Uh, if you don't know who Bessie is, let me know, and I'll point you to Bessie. But again, uh, we'd love for you to join in on that. And then the final thing, if you are a newer visitor to Waypoint Church, or if you just want to do it again, uh, we're doing our new members class. It'll be on Sunday, the 12th of November, or September, excuse me, from 2.30 to 4.30. That's here at the church as well. And this is the intro to what it is about Waypoint, who we are, what we're about. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you could see me. I'd be happy to give you more details. But again, this is the first step in the process. If you're interested in joining the church or if you just want to know more about who we are, you do not have to join the church after this, but it is your first step if you so choose to move forward with Waypoint. But it is a great chance to get to know some folks and also get to know us as a church. Uh, usually it's myself, one of our leaders at least will be there and we'll spend some time together, try to keep it pretty short, but uh, and answer any questions you may have about Waypoint. But this morning we're going to move into our confession of faith. Uh, if you remember, we have officially finished the Shorter Catechism. We went all the way through over the past year or so. And uh, this week, I felt like the New City Catechism hit the nail on the head for where we're going in our sermon this morning. We're going to look at the cross this morning. And the New City Catechism is a catechism, same thing, developing on the ideas of Scripture. What do we believe? And this question, again, will hit right at the heart of what we're doing this morning as we'll read Matthew uh, the book of Matthew a little bit later in our service. But the question, number 24, if you would respond with the answer to, why was it necessary for Christ, the Redeemer, to die? Since death is the punishment for sin, Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and bring us back to God. By His substitutionary atoning death, he alone redeems us from hell and gains for us forgiveness of sin, righteousness, and everlasting life. And as you read through that, there may be some of those words that you're wondering, what exactly does it mean? And my prayer is that over the next two weeks, Lord willing, we'll look at the death and resurrection of Jesus. We will answer what almost every single piece of that confession actually means in our sermon series. So I encourage you to be here. Uh, obviously, you're here today and next week as we continue our series, The Story of Redemption. But now we move to our time of offering. Uh, there is an offering plate in the back and in the front. You can also give online if you so choose. But this is a chance for you to give back to the mission and vision of Waypoint Church. If you are a member here at Waypoint, we encourage you to support us in this way. This is an act of worship, of you giving back what God has so given to you. Again, we are stewards of what God has given. We are just the people that God has given certain things, and we are just giving back a small portion of what God has done. So if you are a visitor with us, again, feel no compulsion to give, but we encourage you to consider uh, being part of what we're doing here at Waypoint, not only here in Nocatee, but beyond as well. So again, if you have questions about that, you can see me, see one of our elders. We'd be happy to tell you what our vision, what our mission is, and what we want, and what, what we believe God is doing here at Waypoint. But if you would, please pray with me now as we ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word and also to bless our giving this morning. But some of the things you can be praying for uh, as well is things like uh, the church, especially in Afghanistan, the persecuted church, but there especially where Christians are being persecuted at a harsh rate. 
but also uh, more on a personal note, uh, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast is about to be hit on about 10 hours uh, with a Cat 4, potentially Cat 5 storm. So we give you in prayer that God would use that, but also mainly that there would be protection for those folks uh, in both of those locations. So let's pray together, ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word, to bless our giving this morning, but also to bless our nation, our country, and our world. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do come. Lord, and as we come, we enter into Your house on a beautiful morning. Lord, we come and the sun is shining. Lord, we come and there's beautiful sunrise. There's a rest that we can have here. Lord, we know that as we come together, you will be with us in this place. Lord, we know that we will not face the type of persecution that some around the world are facing. Lord, that we can come and simply worship in peace. Lord, that we can sing songs of praise. That we can pray. Lord, that we can open the scriptures. Lord, even that, something that many around the world cannot do in public. And yet, Lord, you have opened the door for us to come into this house of worship, to come into this place and be part of your kingdom work here in Nocatee, but Lord, also beyond. So Lord, we do just thank you for this time as we begin our time together, Lord, as we set aside one day in seven. Lord, as we know that you have called us to set apart this one day. Lord, to bring glory to the name of Christ. Lord, to bring glory to the name of God. But Lord, also for us to worship. Lord, you have created us to be worshipers. You created us to be those who are stewards of the good gifts that you've given us. So, Lord, we pray that we would be active in our worship this morning. Lord, that we'd be active participants in hearing and reading and knowing the Word of God. Lord, that we'd be actively giving back to the mission and work of your church. Lord, that we'd be actively pursuing holiness and righteousness and godliness in our own lives and in the lives of our families. Lord, as we begin this new study in the book of Zechariah, as we begin the study of John, we pray that you'd illuminate your word for our Bible studies this coming semester, Lord, that this would be a sweet time for people to grow, to understand, to know what it means to follow you, to love you, to serve you. But Lord, most of all, I pray that all of us would come to a greater understanding of who you are and what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. Because Lord, your whole word points to that simple fact. Lord, that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So, Lord, we thank you for that this morning, the simple truth of the gospel, that we are not our own, but we have been bought with a price. We have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, this morning we do lift up those in need. Lord, we know that there are great needs among our own body. Lord, there is great amount of sickness. Lord, we know that there are people suffering. There are people hurting. Lord, both physically, emotionally, spiritually. Lord, we pray that you'd meet those needs, Lord, that you'd meet all of us exactly where we are this morning, Lord, that we would have the grace needed for it to be bestowed upon each and every one of us. Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters that are in the persecuted church, especially now, Lord, we've seen it firsthand. Lord, what a great witness we see when we hear, even in a place like Afghanistan, the church is exploding, Lord, that the gospel is going forth. We pray that you would allow us to be similar in our conviction, similar in our zeal, Lord, that nothing would get in the way of us worshiping. Lord, nothing would get in the way of us meeting together, being together as the body of Christ. Lord, again, most of all, we do pray for your grace in all these things. Lord, we pray even for the hurricane that is coming. Lord, we know that this is part of your plan for some purpose. You are going to use it for your glory and the good of your people. Lord, we do pray for a hedge of protection for those in its path. But Lord, most of all, we pray that it would turn hearts, turn attention towards you and your grace. Lord, we pray that the church would be a beacon of hope in the midst of a great chaos. But Lord, in all of this, we do pray that your word would continue to guide our steps. Would you continue to guide us forward? But Lord, most of all, we pray that you would be glorified and we would be sanctified. Lord, that we would be edified by the reading, the preaching, the teaching, and the singing of your word this morning. We do pray all of this in your Son's perfect and holy name. Amen. So I don't know if you all know this, but um, I was a music therapy major in college. (laughs) Um, And so obviously I feel a lot of power in music. And um, so we did this song, Behold the Lamb, uh, probably about six to nine months ago, I'm guessing. Eric started it with us. And... um, I just fell in love with it. So 
I love the behold part. I think there's a, a book that we read in one of the small groups that we did that talked about the word behold, and it's such a powerful word, so behold the lamb. Um, but before you get to that celebratory chorus, um, there's in verse 1 and verse 2 that I think the words are incredibly powerful. So if you don't mind, take whatever posture you like to soak these words in, close your eyes, just think on them, um, and I want to read them to you first before we sing them. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we cursed your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Now, if you don't mind standing and singing these words with me.
goodbye to the kids up to fifth grade. They want to exit this door and go with um, Billy and Casey. And um, if you want to also grab some coffee or say hello to their new face, that would be great. We'll resume just a little bit. Well, good morning. As you begin to find your seats, I'd encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. As uh, we've been doing, we're continuing our study on the idea or the theme of the story of redemption. We're going from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelation. We're looking at what is the overarching story of the gospel. So last week, if you were with us, we did the uh, Christmas story, that we did the birth of Christ. This week, we're doing Good Friday, we're doing the crucifixion. Lord willing, next week we'll do Easter, so we're going to do all the high holidays for you in a three-week period, just in case you're wondering where we're going next. But again, we're going to do a few things uh, this morning where I hope it continues this idea of what does it mean and what is the overarching story of the gospel. And today, as I said, we're going to be looking at the crucifixion, one of the pinnacles of the story. What exactly did Jesus accomplish on Calvary. What is it that Jesus came to do? Last week we said he came to seek and to save the lost. And this week we're going to be seeing how Jesus accomplished that on the cross. So if you have your Bibles again, we are going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 27 beginning in verse 32. We're going to read through verse 54. Uh, But again, let's turn to the Lord and ask him to bless our time in his word and then we'll jump into Matthew chapter 27. Father, we do come before your throne this morning. Lord, we are just amazed at the words we just sang. Lord, amazed that you were willing to lay down your life for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just pray this morning as we come to one of those passages that is really at the heart of the gospel. Lord, the idea that Jesus came to die for us, that Jesus came to lay his life down for the lost. Lord, we pray that this would be a fruitful study for us. That would be a time for us to come to understand Lord, to be convicted of sin, to be drawn closer to the Father, to be drawn closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we just thank you for this time. We just pray that you would continue to guide our steps, Lord, that you would be with us even as we read, even as we hear your word preached. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have, and we pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. So, If you would please stand for the reading of God's word this morning, if you are able. So some of the things we are not going to read this morning is what leads up to the crucifixion. Again, we know that Jesus was falsely accused. We know that Jesus was beaten, that he was essentially at the point of death almost when he gets to the cross. And this begins the crucifixion, the greatest injustice in human history, we could call it. But this is the inerrant, the infallible, and the inspired Word of God to us this morning. So all of you here, this is the Word of the Lord to us today. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 32. 
As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine and drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, which the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sambachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this is his man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Then when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. May God bless your hearts with the reading of his word, please be seated. So as I said, this is one of those stories that we've all heard. It's the heart of the gospel is that Jesus laid down his life. And yet, I'm going to say something this morning that may shock you. And that is, it may be a bad thing as a pastor to say, but I am not a big fan of Christian movies. I don't know if you've seen many of the Christian movies that have come out. There's been a fair amount of them. I've been told usually when one comes out, someone comes up and says, James, you have to go watch this movie. And every now and then I'll go watch it. And typically, they're usually very cheesy. They're usually oversimplistic. And they miss the heart of the gospel in my mind in that they usually pit Christians against someone else, the Christian being the moral, righteous brilliant person that's going to destroy the atheist or whoever it may be that they're trying to convince. Usually some biblical themes are there, but again, what's missing in my mind is it leaves me asking, would this make anyone want to seek out Jesus? Does this movie make me pursue and say, who is this Jesus that they're talking about? Who is this Savior that they're talking about? Does it make people say, I need to know that guy. I need to know that Jesus. Now, for me, there's one film that I think actually did a lot better job, in my humble opinion, and that was in 2004, probably the movie all of you have seen, if I had to guess, but it was Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. It came out in 2004, and again, it was one of those movies that became really a cultural phenomenon. I was amazed by, when I saw what it beat out in the box office, for instance, it beat out Harry Potter, it beat The Incredibles, and even the great Lord of the Rings movie in the domestic box office. It was a huge deal. Now again, if you go look at other Christian movies, usually they're at the very bottom of the earners because no one really wants to go see it. Yet this movie hit home for people. For some reason, people wanted to go see this particular movie. And it's interesting when you look at it, what is it really about? It goes through the final days of Jesus' life. And in that movie, if you go watch it, it starts, I believe, I'm not mistaken, it's been a while, but we see it starts with the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, and then we see it, and it goes quite possibly into the most graphic depiction, I would say, of the crucifixion that you'll see anywhere. I don't know, again, if you've never seen the movie, it is meant, I think, to get you out of your seat going, wow, that was what it was like. Again, I think at times we simply say, it's the crucifixion, and it goes right over our heads like, yeah, that's a bad thing. That's difficult. That would be painful. And yet it's gripping when you watch it. 
It's one of those movies that typically, as you're walking out, when I went to the theater and saw it, half the people are in there weeping. They don't even know what they're weeping about, but they're like, that was emotionally moving. It moved me to this place. Some of the words I heard people use to describe it, it was powerful. It was gut-wrenching. It made me think. But I remember in my own head, I said there was one major issue in the movie. And I think it summed up well. There was a critic, Michael O'Sullivan, said there's one major issue with this movie. And I want to read what he said. He said, the movie puts us in a situation where we can't help but feel Jesus' pain. And then he hits the nail on the head when he says, if only Gibson, again, Mel Gibson, the producer, had taken time to tell us more of why it mattered. I want you to think about that movie because what it does, again, it depicts the crucifixion. It depicts the beating of Jesus. It is brutal in its imagery. But if I'm watching the movie, again, I don't know who this Jesus is. I don't know why this Jesus is being accused. I don't know what it accomplished on my behalf. All I can see is the brutality of it. One person said it gives us the spectacle But does it give us the gospel? And that is where I think we see this movie doesn't help us understand the person and work of Jesus. It gives a picture of what Jesus did, but does it help us understand who Jesus is? So today, my hope, as I've already said, is to get to the core of the message of the cross. What was accomplished on the cross? Why do we celebrate Good Friday? Why is it not Black Friday? Why is it not Bad Friday? We call it Good Friday. It's the day that Jesus was crucified, and yet we call it good. And the real question is, how does it accomplish the redemption that is promised? That word we've been talking about, the story of redemption, just in case we weren't sure what it means, or it's been a while, the theme, redemption, and what does it mean? Redemption means to purchase at a cost. The story of redemption means that you and I, Christians were purchased with a price, and today the price is going to be paid. We're going to see Jesus pays the price for you. That is the heart of the gospel. That's the heart of our story. That's the heart of Scripture, is that someone laid down their life for you, for another. So what do we see here? Again, we're going to go through three big themes of this story of redemption. The first being substitution. What takes place on the cross, and one thing that we have to see is this idea of substitution. And what we have to see is so many times we look at the cross and we say, that was a sacrifice on my behalf. It's no different in some people's minds than in Israel when they would take a bull or a goat or a dove or whatever else, and they would sacrifice that creature on their behalf. But I want you to hear what's really going on at the cross is not simply a sacrifice. It's a substitution in that Jesus takes our place. There's a picture of you deserve to be there. If anything, I wish Mel Gibson's movie would say, this should be you. That should be written across the top somewhere in that story. This is your place. And instead, Jesus takes it on. Look at Paul in Romans 6.23. He says it so well. If you want the gospel in one verse, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There was a debt to be paid. There was a debt that was owed. And Jesus said, I'm going to pay it. Not you, church. Not you. Me. I'm going to pay it. So again, the story of redemption doesn't exist without the need being there. The wages of sin is death. What you and I have earned, if you want to know, what's my role in redemption? We earned the debt. That's the only role we play in the story of redemption. We earned the debt that is owed. And that's scary to think about because we often want to say, I want to be part of it. I want to say, I had this great role in my salvation, and yet all we bring is the debt. And thus we need the Savior. The Savior has to be there. When we look at this, I think John Stott says it so well when he says, the essence of human sin, again, if you want to break down human sin in his mind, he says, is we human beings substitute ourselves for God. Is that not at the heart of most sin? We're putting ourselves where God is meant to be. And he says, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for us. We put ourselves where only God deserves to be, and God puts Himself in the person of Jesus Christ where we deserve to be. 
That's at the heart of the gospel is that Jesus is where you and I deserve to be. Jesus took that on, and it's the very heart of our redemption. And then we see it again. We've said it over and over again in this story. It's God initiating, saying, you can't save yourself, and I'm going to provide the Savior. Last week, He gave the Savior when Jesus was born. This week, He says, the Savior is going to lay down His life because that's why He came. He came to seek and to save the lost. And this was the plan. It wasn't simply He's going to walk in and say, I'm Jesus, you're all forgiven. It was always this. And yet some people ask, was that really the plan? Did God really from eternity past say, I'm going to lay down my life or I'm going to lay down the life of Jesus? There's no way Jesus was really the Savior. There's no way God really knew He'd be crucified. If you don't believe that, first you could start with Isaiah 53, which we went through a few weeks ago, where it says He would be the Savior that was stricken for us, afflicted for us. We can also see what it means in Acts 2.23. We went through the book of Acts, if you recall, and Peter answers the question, was Jesus always the plan? Was there another plan that got... Foiled was it plan B? Was this plan C? And Jesus or Peter says in Acts 2.23, he says, This Jesus, hear me now, church, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It was not an accident. It wasn't the second option. He was delivered up according to the definite plan of God. This was the plan from the beginning. You need a Savior. His head would be, he would crush the head of Satan. His heel would be bruised. And this goes back to one of the central doctrines that we've been hitting on throughout this whole series is the absolute sovereignty of God in all things, including the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was all part of God's divine plan. It was all part of His divine providence for you. I want you to hear again is there's not a molecule out of place. Here there's something smaller than a molecule now that we found in science, but there's not a single thing out of place. Nothing outside of divine providence. Do we really think the cross was just some random event? Do we really think God would have done it if there was some other way that He said, you know what, I'm just going to do the cross just for kicks. But it continues the theme we discussed last week. We looked at Philippians 2, 5-7 last week when Jesus took on flesh. We said it was addition by subtraction, or subtraction by addition, excuse me. But I want you to go to verse 8 today. Philippians 2, verse 8. What did Jesus do He came down, he took on flesh, he became man. But in verse 8 it says, and being found in human form, so he's a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But again, this idea of substitution is not a new thing. Again, the Israelites had a sacrificial system. They were told to sacrifice an animal in their place. Again, it was bulls, it was goats, it was doves, whatever they could do. But they had this thing in place. The key to the gospel is that we read in Hebrews, the blood of bull and goats does not take away the sins of the world. And we finally had the real sacrifice in Jesus It was always pointing forward to Jesus. It was never about the bulls and the goats. It was never about the doves. It was never about Israel. It was always pointing to Jesus. So the key we have to grasp this morning is that Jesus didn't go to the cross for no reason. He went to take your place. He went to take my place that we deserve, and God said, I'm going to send it all on Jesus instead. And it really leads to our next point, which is, again, one of those words that we often say, or you may have heard in our Presbyterian circles, we like big theological words. And yet the next thing we're going to look at is this idea of propitiation. You may say, James, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Very simply, it's a theological term that, again, we love, but it's a simple concept. Propitiation at its simplest means to satisfy It means that the wrath of God in this case has been satisfied on our behalf. So what exactly does it mean? It goes back to what we read in Romans when Paul says the wages of sin is death and there's a debt that has to be paid. 
And for us, that's one of those things that if you talk about sin and death in the church today, we don't like talking about it. What you're saying, Pastor, that my wages is death. What you're saying is what I've earned is death. What you're saying is I can't earn my own way. And yet what Paul calls you to, what Jesus calls you to, what Peter, what John, whatever you want to look at, they all call you to acknowledge your own sin and rightly deserving the wrath of God. And yet, when we, even if you can get to that point, even if you get someone to the place of saying, I understand sin, I understand my need, the next question that I've heard from many people actually is, couldn't God simply wipe away sin? If your God is so loving, your God is so gracious, your God is so wonderful, and yet He won't just wipe away our sins. Kind of goes back to that question, can't He just save everyone? Isn't that the easy answer? Just wipe out sin, and then we can all be good, we can all go to heaven, and we'll all be there and then celebrate. But I want you to hear what Hebrews chapter 9 says. Hebrews 9, 22 and 26, the author of Hebrews says why this can't happen. He says, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Note what he says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. For then we would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. There has to be a payment For sin, there had to be a payment, and it says the payment is blood. There's not simply a wiping of the debt. We say the same thing in our own judicial system. We say if you are convicted of a crime, you have to pay the debt, whatever the debt is. But why? Why can't he just do it? Why can't he just move past it? Why can't Jesus just come and say, you're all forgiven? And the key is that God is perfectly righteous. God is perfectly holy. And it's outside of His nature to simply wipe away sin. Our perfectly holy and righteous God cannot have communion with sin. It would go against His own nature. And so we have to be redeemed. How do we do it? Again, God could have simply said, I'm going to wipe away humanity came pretty close in the flood. He could have done it with Adam and Eve. He could have said, I'm done in Genesis 3. He could have said, I'm done with even the time of Noah and not saved Noah. He could have wiped us away at any point in time. And yet he sends Jesus. The author of Hebrews says he sends Jesus to give us what we need to justify sinners as well. So God becomes not only the just God, He becomes the justifier. He becomes the one that makes us right with God. So then we turn to, if we believe that to be true, what actually happens on the cross? Why did Jesus do it? What did it accomplish? And the answer, if I were to ask you, even my own kids, if I say, why did Jesus die on the cross? I hope and I believe their answer would be, He died for me. He died for my sins. And yet, that's where we stop. But I think when we look at the cross, so often we look at the things, even what we talked about the movie focused on. We talk about the devastation of the cross. We talk about the pain, the beating, the humiliation, all these other parts of it. And I want you to see that the focus is never on what Jesus actually accomplished. We say Jesus died for me, and yet most of you, I think if I were to ask, what did it really mean? You'd say, well, he died for me. And we say, that's it, he just died. And yet, note what Matthew says in verses 45 and 46. This is the heart of it. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And by the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. Now if you don't know what that means, it means very simply, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we pass right over that. I want you to think about that. What does it mean that Jesus was forsaken by God on the cross? Because we often look at the cross and we say, how could God do that? He put Jesus through this awful situation, and yet we miss. What does it mean? What I want to challenge you to this morning is the greatest weight of the cross for Jesus was not physical. 
The greatest issue that Jesus faced on the cross was not the spikes going in his wrists. It was not him having to struggle to breathe. It was the spiritual nature of it. Again, what did Jesus experience on the cross? He experienced the full weight of sin. And what is sin ultimately? It's separation from God. He experienced the full separation of God in that even though they are one, it says he forsake him in that moment. I want you to think about this just for a minute because we can't even comprehend this. There was perfect communion between God and Christ. Between God the Father and God the Son. I think the closest thing, and it doesn't even come close in my mind, would be a husband and wife. I want you to imagine in some way, shape, or form, if you are hopefully in love with your spouse, that for a season you were said, you are completely cut off. What would that experience be for you? Now, increase it by about a billion fold. Then you're approaching maybe what it was like for Jesus. The devastating effect was not simply the physical toll. Think about even in our own study, when we looked at Adam and Eve, they knew their relationship changed the second sin entered the world. They knew their separation with God started. Jesus went from perfect communion to devastating separation. And yet he did it because he was the perfect sacrificial lamb for us. Last week, Jesus was born a man. Oh, that's what we talked about. He took on flesh. He lived perfectly holy and righteous. He lived the life we couldn't. He accomplished what Adam failed to do. If anything, Jesus did everything that we were told to do. He did everything that Adam was called to do. Live righteously before me, Adam. Keep my commandments, Adam. And what will you receive? You will receive life, Adam. And yet Jesus does it all, and what does he receive? He receives death. He receives spiritual separation. He's forsaken by the Father for a season. He's required to lay down his life, even though he lived it perfectly. Did everything right, and yet still took on the penalty, still took on the debt, still took on the death we deserved. Ultimately, we get to what did Jesus accomplish? And that's where we're going to end today. This idea of reconciliation. There's a sense that God is reconciled to man through Christ Jesus. So again, just so we're clear, so far we've established that Jesus put himself in our place. He substituted himself for us. There was propitiation. He bore the wrath we justly deserved. And now we ask, what does it do? If Jesus substituted himself, if Jesus paid the debt, where does that leave us, church? The answer is we are finally reconciled to God. The story of redemption is about us being reconciled to God. And we see this in Genesis 3. Again, going back, we see there's there's a separation For us, there's a spiritual and physical separation between God and Adam and Eve. We all see that there's separation between Adam and Eve. For the first time, they realized they were naked. They were ashamed. And they knew the relationship had changed. And yet now we see Jesus changes everything. And I want you to hear it in John 19, verse 30. It's one of those simple verses in all of Scripture, but it's so profound when Jesus says, On the cross, what does he say? And you may know where we're going here. He says, it is finished. It's done. There's nothing left for you, church, to do. There's nothing left for me to do. And if you want that said in a different way, this is probably one of my favorite quotes. This is from A.W. Pink. Again, an older theologian that is no longer with us. But A.W. Pink says it this way. Again, I want you to hear this. All things had been done which the law required. All things established which prophecy predicted. All things brought to pass which foreshadowed. All things accomplished which the Father had given to Him. All things performed which were needed for our redemption. And This is one of those spots where I told someone recently, if I don't get an amen for this, I'm never going to get one at the end of this quote. So, there's your uh, 
Just setting you up there. But again, nothing was left wanting. The costly ransom was given. The great conflict endured. Sin's wages had been paid. And divine justice had been satisfied. Amen. Thank you, church. <laughs> but if that doesn't sum up what Christ did on the cross, it's why Jesus can say, it's finished. There's nothing left for you to do. At some point, we have to come to this same conclusion. You have to come there. And today, you may be sitting in these chairs saying, I don't know that I believe this, James. You may be saying, I'm not so sure about this whole Jesus thing. I'm not so sure if this is really the case. What I'm going to tell you today is that you and I have to come to the place where we simply say, there is no way for me to be reconciled to God outside of the cross, outside of Jesus. We hear so many times, well, there's many ways to heaven. I'm here to tell you there's only one way. The old hymn, Jesus paid it all. Again, some of you may know that hymn. And uh, as I was told, stay in my lane, so I'm not going to sing it. But the refrain states, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. What is our part? Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That is the story of redemption. If you want to hear that Jesus washed away the crimson stain and left it white as snow. But the final thing that I want to look at today, the final aspect of this sacrifice, what did Jesus do? Jesus washes us clean. He reconciles us to God. But not only that, He makes us righteous. You want to hear that? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.21, or you'll see it on the screen. Paul, again, here, the great theologian Paul says, For our sake He made Jesus, again, made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. We are made righteous. Brothers and sisters, today, if Christ, if you are in Christ, when He looks at you, He does not see sin. He does not see death. He does not see yourself. He doesn't see you. But what does He see? He sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. And that leads to our last big word for the day. Your big theological word is imputation. Again, you may say, I don't know what it means. Imputation very simply means credited. When, G, when God looks at you, He says, your account has been paid in full by Jesus. Your account has been wiped clean. It is no longer stained with sin and death. And then when He looks at Jesus, He sees your sin, your death that has been covered by the finished work of Him on the cross. Again, God took our sin, our shame, our debt, our punishment, and our death and laid it on Jesus. That is not good news. I don't know what good news is. Because in legal terms, what does it mean? We are now justified and there's no longer a debt on our ledger. We can say, well, they've been acquitted, they've been there, and it's still there. Some people still say the record will always follow you. I remember hearing that when we were younger. If you do something wrong, the record is going to follow you. Today, what we can say is if you are in Christ Jesus, we believe in something called double imputation, that your Righteousness is from Christ, but all your debt, past, present, and future, has been laid upon Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, I paid it all. Notice that Jesus on the cross doesn't say it's finished except for. He doesn't say it's finished for those of you who do it right. He says, it is finished. So again, when God looks at us, He sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. Based on your faith in Jesus Christ, nothing more, nothing less. There's nothing left wanting in His sacrifice. So again, we fully grasp what happened in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Those are the next two things we're going to look at. The resurrection and ascension of Jesus. We begin to understand the story of redemption. We begin to see what the Old Testament promised back in Genesis 3 was not some random event. When Isaiah 53 is talking about this Jesus, when we talked about the law being given and saying the law is pointing to something greater, it's all pointing to this moment. The life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Today I hope you see the cross an integral part of your story of redemption. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do confess that we are prone to wander or we are prone to 
continue in our own sin and death. Lord, we are prone to see the cross. Lord, to hear the story of redemption. Lord, as we sang, the story is written on your hands now. And yet, Lord, some of us refuse to turn away. We refuse to turn away from sin and death that has so engripped us. Lord, and we refuse to simply turn to the cross. Lord, as the great hymn said, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And yet, Lord, that's what you've done for us. Lord, Christ came and laid his life down for the sheep. Lord, we thank you this morning for the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for the promise that is ours throughout Scripture that all who confess Jesus as Lord will be saved. So when I pray that if there are any here who have not heard that message of salvation, that have not heard that powerful message that Jesus came to lay his life down for the sheep, Lord, may they confess that even now. Lord, may our tongues confess, may our hearts be open to the gospel. But Lord, most of all, we pray that you would continue to be glorified in the preaching of your word, Lord, and even in the response of your people. We know it takes your spirit to move, so we pray your spirit will be moving even now. And we just pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Please stand for our closing song. thank all of you for joining us here at Waypoint. As always, it's our joy to worship the Lord and Savior with you as we join together with the saints across the world that are doing the same, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, one just point of encouragement, I was with uh, the Florida Church Planning Network this past week uh, for a couple days, and I want you to just be encouraged that there are six church plants, including ours, that are currently in the works. Uh, I think we're uh, kind of the furthest along, which is interesting. Uh, now the elder statesman, which is scary to think about, but again, I'd encourage you to be praying for them as well. Pray for these men that are on the front lines of what God is doing. Uh, again, most of them are talking about this very thing we're talking about, the beauty of the gospel and how the world needs it. And they're going to places that uh, some, there are no churches, which is fascinating that even today uh, we are still missing out on so many people that need to hear the gospel. So again, uh, be encouraged, but also be in prayer. Uh, the thing I heard this past week is we should be planting over 1,000 churches a year right now to keep up with population growth. Uh, net gain 
Uh, and right now, we're, I believe, across evangelicals, we're averaging less than 300. So we uh, need more churches. Uh, but again, be encouraged that the Lord is doing great work uh, in Florida and beyond. But it's exciting to hear what God is doing elsewhere. But now, receive the Lord's benediction from the book of Hebrews. This is probably going to be our benediction for the next couple weeks. Now, may the God of peace, who brought from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Joy, joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy, the joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength.